Good morning. Welcome to worship on this special day. Um, not only is it a special serve day, but you also see that we're already ready for lunch, right? Um, yeah, oh, not very much excitement for food here. Okay, that's okay. You have a little bit of time to work up an appetite. So, um, welcome. We celebrate the worth, dignity, and gifts of every person as a child of God here at St. Paul's, and it is so exciting to worship with you today. Happy first day of Serve Week. Today is our kickoff to the week, and you will hear more details about that later on in the service. Um, a few other announcements. Our summer Bible reading plan is out, and we have cards that have the scripture, but I want to tell you about this awesome craft kit because uh, Denise and I put it together, so uh, I'm kind of personally excited for it. If you are a craft person or you'd like to try one, as you read the scripture, you can also create a rainbow craft that you can hang up and display, and the bonus is that if you send a picture of your completed craft to me, there will be prizes involved. So. Yes, Ooh, we're, we're excited about prizes, that's awesome. So I hope that you will look for this out in the lobby. Um, you can look under the rainbow and it, they will be right there. If we happen to run out of these today, just let me know and I'd be happy to make more. Next Sunday, June 2nd, between services, we'd love for you to come to a reception to show appreciation for Denise Estes and her time as the administrative assistant here at the church. And while her time in that role is ending, and we're very sad about that, we're so excited that she's continuing to be active in the church in so many other ways. So if you would join us next Sunday between services, we will get to thank her and celebrate her. We also have additional celebrations today. Alice and Don Wright are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. <laughs> And Matt and Barbara Campbell are celebrating their 65th wedding anniversary. Awesome. And we thank the Campbells for our altar flowers today. And uh, congratulations to both couples. It is such a joy to be able to celebrate with them today. And I invite you to join me in our call to worship. As a shepherd seeks a lost sheep, so God seeks and rescues and calls us home. Like a woman who searches for a lost coin until it's found. So God rejoices over one person restored to wholeness. As a father receives a returning wayward son. So God welcomes us and lets the past be past. Ever loving and all inviting God, help us to make room for you and for others. For to welcome a stranger, is to welcome you, and to receive you is to receive all your beloved. Help us receive and welcome and invite one another with rejoicing. In the name of Jesus Christ and by the power of your spirit, amen. Let's stand as you're able and sing our opening song together.
sing together, you give life. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you restore.
God, help us to live solidly in your grace. Help us to see ourselves in the same spirit in which you see us. That we may be secured in our relationship with you. And that we can't wait for others to share in that too. God, on this Memorial Day weekend, we lift to you those who have lost loved ones in active military service. We also pray for peace to prevail in our world. God, may your peace dwell in us, among us. We pray, too, that we may be peacemakers in our world, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our country, and everywhere we go, even as we still seek your justice. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Friends, once again, good morning. Uh, my name is Kyle Reynolds. I'm the senior pastor here. I'm so grateful uh, that you're joining us for worship, that we're kicking off Serve Week together. Um, each week in our service, we take some time to celebrate ministry that's happening in our community and uh, that you all make possible. And so, of course, this week we're focusing on Serve Week. Uh, we are excited that now through Saturday, every day, we have opportunities for folks to serve um, and we will have people out in the community that many of you are participating in that. And um, uh, I hope that if you haven't signed up, you'll, you'll find ways to plug in. But just wanted to share a few uh, highlights or celebrations or opportunities coming up. First of all, uh, we have lunch right after this. Um, and so you are welcome to stay, encouraged to stay. Uh, somebody suggested we block the doors, which I don't think we're going to do. But uh, we have a lot of food and we would love it if you would help us eat it. So you are welcome to stay and we hope that you will. Uh, during lunch, we're also going to hear from Cindy Moore. Um, part of what Cindy Moore does is she spends a lot of time um, uh, around the world in various medical mission trips. And so we're going to hear about one that she's got coming up. Um, and I'm excited for that. I think it's a great way to kick off Serve Week. Um, and then if you can stay even after lunch, we'll have people here through the early part of the afternoon serving uh, with projects here at St. Paul's. Uh, some of them are, are sort of for the church, and some of them are things that we're doing here and that, that we'll be sharing with the community. So uh, you're invited to stay. Uh, a few spots that we still have open through the week. Um, Wednesday night, uh, we're going to be at the Hub beginning at 5 o'clock. That's the Hub Argentine. And so um, I want to encourage you to come and be a part of that. Uh, but that starts with dinner at 5 o'clock, which is a great reason to be there. Uh, it'll be uh, provided by the neighbors there. Um, but we need to know today if you're going to go to that. And so if you can sign up out at the welcome area or sign up online, we need to give them a count for dinner. But that's 5 o'clock, and then we'll have opportunities to serve a long time, alongside the community there um, afterwards. And then uh, Canby's Market is a new partnership for us. Wednesday and Thursday in the mornings, we have opportunities. That's uh, distributing fresh produce to folks who otherwise might not have access to it. And then um, there is a community garden work day and, um, uh, over in our community garden next Saturday from 9 to 1. Um, and that also a part of that is uh, an Eagle Scout project as we're updating the compost bin there. So um, all of those still have opportunities available for you to serve. Um, and, and we would love for you to find a spot that works for you. If you have any questions about any of those, uh, you can come find myself or Pastor Jessica or Pastor Eric, and we'd be happy to answer your questions. But we hope that, that you can get plugged in. Um, in just a moment, our ushers are going to come forward and receive our offering. Uh, but as they do that, we're going to hear uh, kind of a special song that has a little bit of a story to it. And I think Mitch is going to tell us about it. The song is called Love is Stronger, and it was written by a queer delegate to General Conference. And it was one of the songs 
that was sung on the floor celebrating the removal of the ordination ban on queer clergy. Love is stronger. Love is so much stronger. Love is stronger. Love is stronger than hate. Love is strong. I'm inviting you now to stand and sing with us our doxology. Oh, bless the gifts our hands have brought, and bless the work our hearts have planned. Ours is the faith, the will, the thought, the rest, oh God, is in your hand. We join me in prayer. Good and holy God, we give you thanks for the many gifts that you have entrusted to us of time, of energy, of experience, of gifts. And God, we give you thanks now for this opportunity that we have to return a part of what you've given to us, to your ministry, to your work, and to the building of your kingdom in the world. Bless what has been offered and those who have given it. Bless those who will receive. Take these gifts, multiply them, and use them that all might experience your love and your grace. This we ask and pray in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Friends, uh, I want to invite you to take a few moments to greet those who are worshiping with you. If you don't know somebody's name, it's okay to tell them yours and to ask them theirs. As you, uh, as you make your way back to your seats, all right, we're going to be a ruckus crowd today. I see how it is. Uh, as you make your way back to your seats, if we have kids that want to go to Kids Connection, uh, you can see Mr. Gary in the back and head downstairs. Um, that is for children up through sixth grade, and so that is available now, and uh, we'll invite our children to go if they would like and to be a part of that programming down stairs. Um, friends, uh, our scripture lesson today comes from Matthew 25, uh, beginning in verse 31, and I would invite you to hear these words. 
This is Jesus speaking. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate one from another as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to eat. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you as a stranger and welcomed you in, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, very truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are the members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left hand, you who are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and we did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. May God add blessing to our reading and understanding of these words. So this morning we're continuing our series called uh, Everybody Welcome, in which we're looking at what it means for us as a congregation to make sure that, that uh, we are clear about what it means to welcome and include all people, to make sure that folks uh, beyond the walls and within the walls know that at St. Paul's there is a place and there is a welcome for everybody. And so we're in our third week of this series, and uh, we began two weeks ago with the thought uh, of beginning with the end in mind. Um, we talked about this sort of as the, the pre-welcoming. What is it that we do to sort of get ready uh, to prepare before we do the work of welcoming? And so if you were going to have people over to your house, this might be the work of, of shoving all the stuff in the closet so that your guests can't see it. Um, it might be the work of setting the table or running a vacuum, all of these things that we do. But we said we ought to know what the purpose of this gathering is. We don't need to set a fancy, elaborate table if there's no meal that's going to be served. And uh, we don't need to clean the upstairs if no one's going to be there. For us as a congregation, that means that we look at things like our welcome statement and our mission statement, and we clarify where it is that we put our energy, who it is that, who it is that we attune our ministry towards and our, our activities and our energy, and then we begin to live that out and tell that story. And because we were beginning with the end in mind, we read from the book of Revelation, this vision of, of all nations and all people being gathered before the throne of the Lamb, saying that glory and honor and praise and salvation belong to God. And we said that if that's the world that we believe God is leading us towards, and that's the future into which we're going to live, that we do well to start practicing that in the midst of our life here and now. And then last week, we celebrated Pentecost uh, with that rushing wind and those tongues of fire falling upon the disciples who are scared in that room, waiting for the next thing that God is going to do. Uh, we began to, to talk about what that means, that, that everybody, the, the first act of the church and the first miracle of the Holy Spirit in this, this new era is that everybody is able to hear this great good news of God in their own language, in their own tongue, in their own dialect, and understand what it is that God is doing. And so for us, that means that we need to make sure that we're doing everything in our power to create safe and welcoming places where when people actually do show up in our midst, they, they know that they're welcome and that they belong and that there's a place for them here uh, so that they can begin to hear what it is that God has to say to them uh, in this particular place. And so as we were talking about that, we ended our reading from Acts with, with Peter quoting Joel, this apocalyptic vision of what was to come, saying that this was a new era of salvation. And it was, it was kind of interesting to me. We, we had this revelation, this apocalyptic vision, and we had Joel. And then this week, we have another apocalyptic vision. And I don't know what that says about a welcoming series. Uh, that's not usually where I would immediately go when we're talking about welcoming and making the church accessible. I'm just going to be honest, there's another one next week too, um, <laughs> just so you know. But um, we get this, this vision of Jesus sort of uh, talking about this, uh, I would say almost a parable of these 
these end times. And, and this is what's interesting. When we read this text from Matthew, I don't know about you, but in many ways, it's actually more unsettling to me than, than these other ones that we've read. And I think some of it is that the idea that, that Joel is an Old Testament prophet, and so we kind of uh, we, we put that in a box and say that feels very different. And then when we, when we read about tongues of fire, the coming of the Holy Spirit, that's, that's so out of our frame of reference that it almost, it's almost incomprehensible. And so it's easy to just kind of move through it and say, oh, what a strange experience. And when we read Revelation, I think we're often guilty of just saying all of this is kind of a, a strange thing that maybe I'll understand in a day by and by. But, but then we get this text and, and it seems to be much less coded language. And it comes uh, no less from Jesus. And, and I think it's easier to find ourselves in this story. And, and that makes us uncomfortable, or at least it does me. So all of these, though, all of these scriptures, all of these visions are intended to help us think about what it means for us as a community of faith to make sure that everybody feels welcome at St. Paul's. And I think that's especially important as we kick off this serve week. So I want to tell you a story on Friday. I went to get my hair cut, which not one of you said it looked good, by the way. <laughs> Too late. Doesn't count. But I was talking to my barber, and I, I've, I've been going to the same guy for 10 or 12 years. And uh, at some point in the conversation, I said something about um, he looked like he was sort of trimming up a little bit or, or had been to the gym. And I said something about that. And he said, thanks. Uh, I appreciate that. And and he's always struck me as somebody, we've had a lot of conversation about um, him in the gym and about, uh, he's very careful about what he eats. And, and so he's talking about his routine, his cardio and his lifting on a regular basis and being more selective in, in what he's eating right now. And I said, uh, that's awesome. And he said, well, I guess that's good, but it kind of came in a way I wouldn't prefer. He was recently at a doctor's appointment, just his annual physical, and they ran all the numbers and they did all the tests. And his doctor called him afterwards and said, hey, your, your cholesterol is really high, and you need to start doing some stuff about that. I, I wonder if you've ever had that experience of going in for sort of a routine checkup or, or a physical or a well visit, and, and the doctor says that, that these numbers or, or these labs or, or this information indicates that it's time to shift something. So Lindsay Armstrong likens the passage that we read today from Matthew as Jesus' annual well check with a doctor, that it provides a mirror for us to reflect on our own lives, to consider how it is that we spend our energy and what it is that we're focused on, and to see if it aligns with that which brings health and life. And I think that's really interesting. So we dive into this text and we get this, this imagery of the Son of Man co cast both as a, a, an enthroned king, sort of bigger and holier than all, but, but also as a simple shepherd, sort of among the least of these. And then there ensues this conversation in which Jesus says to one group of people, you welcomed me, you welcomed me when I was hungry and when I was thirsty, and, and you created a safe place for me when I was a stranger, and you gave me clothing when I didn't have any, and, and you visited me when I was sick and in prison. And the thing is that they didn't know that. They did know that there was suffering in the world, and they did know that things weren't as they were intended to be. They did know that there were those around them who were more vulnerable, and they did know that they could do something about it. And so they chose to do something about it, but they didn't know that when they did, they were encountering God. And then you could say the same thing about the others. Jesus says to these other ones, depart from me, get away from me. Because when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. And when I was thirsty, you didn't give me something to drink. And when I was a stranger, you didn't provide shelter and safety. And when I was naked, you didn't provide clothing. And when I was sick, you didn't come to visit me. And when I was a prisoner, you paid me no attention. And they respond, and this is interesting. The language is a little different. They say, when was it that we saw you, Lord, but we did not serve you? That's the actual language. That's the actual translation. Diakoneo, when was it that we saw you, but we did not serve you? This is the same language. It's the first time it's used in this story, but uh, Jesus quotes in Matthew 20 when he says, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to be a servant to all. 
And as I have done, you should do likewise. That's what's being talked about here. Jesus, uh, the, the people are saying uh, to, the, to the Son of Man, when was it that we saw all of these things and that we didn't serve you? And Jesus says, when you didn't do it to the least of these, when you didn't serve them, you didn't serve me. And in some ways, they're not that different because uh, they looked around and they knew that the world was not as it was supposed to be. And they knew that there were people who were uh, vulnerable around them. And, and they also knew that they could do something about it. And yet, when they chose not to, they didn't know that they were ignoring God. And so, in Jesus' well check that this story is, it seems that there might be a, a few systems to which uh, Jesus is calling us to reflect and to think about. Just like a doctor will check our, our cardio and our cholesterol and our mental health when we go in for an annual exam, I think there's a few systems that, that Jesus is inviting us to think about. So one of them would be our theological imagination. And this is interesting. So uh, back a couple weeks ago, uh, it was Jesus that was the lamb on the throne in Revelation. That's how we imagine it. And then today we have uh, this idea that, that there is this, this enthroned king before everybody, this big and powerful one. But we also get the idea that God is this overlooked shepherd and that God is one who is sick and a stranger and God is a prisoner. And, and all that begs the question, how is it that we imagine God? What's the, what's the health and what's the, what's the persuasion of our theological imagination? Is God above all and separate and far away from? Or is God simple and accessible and among us? Or is God somehow in a way that we can't fully wrap our heads around both of those things at the same time? One of the central uh, points of this story, I think, is to say that God is not only somewhere else and separate and far away, but God is also among us and speaking and inviting us into the life that's truly life, that, that God dwells with God's people. So the question is, do we have the theological imagination to hold those ideas in tension? Do we have the theological imagination to, to perceive God as both of those and perhaps many more things? That's part of what this wellness check is about. I, I think another thing is our heart. And our heart being the center of our compassion. Where is it that all of that lives? See, this text, as I said earlier, may like you, uh, may like me make you uneasy. And it may not jive always with the, the definition of grace that we understand that I, that I wrote about Friday that we sometimes uh, imagine. It might be, though, that God wants to free us from being overly concerned about ourselves. I think that's the heart check in this text. Uh, when you think about those who need food and who need water, those who are estranged or unhealthy, uh, what is it that we, we think about them? And if we are too busy concerned with ourselves, if we become caught up in all of the things that we ourselves need, if our hearts are only focused on our own desires, we don't have space for what else might be before us. And I think part of what uh, this well check from Jesus is encouraging us to do is to check on the condition of our heart. What is it that we think? What is our first thought? Uh, what is our first belief or assumption when we encounter one who the scripture calls one of the least of these? A third system that we might want to check uh, based on this text is our calendar. Isn't it interesting that, that, that uh, all of these people seem to say, uh, we didn't know that this was going on, and there is the assumption that, that all of them probably would have done more if they were aware. And we're busy people. We get pulled in a lot of directions. I think one of the questions is how it is that, that we make space and time uh, to be in service, to be in connection, to be on the lookout for the ways that God might be speaking. And that might be about carving out intentional time to go and serve some of the least of these. But it might be, friends, a first step just about making enough margin so that when somebody in your workplace, when somebody in your neighborhood, when somebody in your family is hurting you have enough time to actually meet the need. Sometimes we move so quickly from one thing to the next that we can't be bothered with, uh, with interruptions to our tightly packed schedule, that we can't encounter the beauty of what it is to be in service with those around us. And so part of the, the systems that I think Jesus encourages us to check in on is our calendars. And then the last one is our vision. Where is it that we see Jesus among us? 
Does Jesus live in a sanctuary? Uh, does Jesus only occupy this space on Sunday mornings? Or is Jesus out and about in the world? And can we begin to see Jesus, not only in those who seem to have everything going for them, but perhaps those who feel like everything is going against them? Can we begin to see that Jesus is in the vulnerable and the least and the lost and the last, and that, that there we can discover a, a sort of relationship and experience of him that we might not be able to anywhere else? So friends, what does all this have to say about welcoming? As we embark on this journey this week, this Serve Week journey, perhaps we can understand that when we serve and, and when we're in relationship with the most vulnerable, as Jesus calls us to be, that those acts of service, that, that meeting and welcoming and receiving people where they are and just as they are, that all of that is good practice for what it means to welcome to, to, to go uh, perhaps beyond these walls, to go in places and to meet people exactly as they are without expecting change. It will force us to change and be open in ways that we're not inclined to do so. And so while we're focusing most of our energy about what we do here on our campus and on Sunday mornings throughout this series, I also think that when we do that work of encountering and finding and allowing ourselves to be found by the least of these that we learn a great deal about what it means to welcome. And that when we do that work, it will help us in that process of altering our systems that we're talking about, of altering our hearts and our imaginations, our calendars and our vision. And not only that, it's a way to embody this truth that we strive for, that everybody is welcome. And finally, it's a way to reflect this welcome of God that we've already received to say that all of us are included in God's grace. So if we're going to say as a church, everybody welcome, it has to include the least of these as Jesus describes them. And so perhaps it helps us adjust the way that we approach service as well. Instead of thinking as far too often we have that, that we are ones who are, are there to, to serve and to, to bring salvation or answers or to solve problems, if instead we approach it as those who are also seeking to learn and to do life together and to share and to be open to what it is that God might be doing in other places and other people, then we might discover that Jesus is speaking to us in new ways. And and I think that matters for us individually, but it also matters for us as a church as we do our work together. Are we remaining open to the possibility that Jesus is working in and speaking through uh, all of those that we serve? I don't know if uh, you follow the MLB much, um, but Bryce Harper managed to get thrown out of a game on Friday as the third batter, which is impressive. Normally you wait till like later in the game to do that. But uh, Bryce Harper has uh, got me thinking about, about his history a little bit. Uh, he was drafted in 2010 by the Nationals, I believe. And, and when he was drafted, he was thought to be like the new Mr. Baseball. They thought that he was going to turn the MLB on its head and that, that he was going to change the whole game. From the time he was like 12 years old, they were recruiting him. Uh, MLB teams were. And, and he, he graduated early so that he could enter the MLB draft early so that he could start early and there was, there was so much hype about this player coming in, and I'm going to be honest with you, he's a good player. I'm not sure if he's lived up to the hype or not, but uh, he's done a good job. He plays for the Phillies now, but um, there was this interesting story after he got drafted by the Nationals in 2010. Uh, it was the next year that they were in the midst of their, their usual routine physical examinations of players, and, and he got with an optometrist. And the optometrist did his examination and was in shock. Uh, and he said, you have some of the worst vision that I've ever seen an adult have. And he actually said to him, I don't know how you can see a ball to hit it. So here was this guy who was supposed to be a phenom of baseball. And this optometrist is saying, your vision is so bad that it's remarkable that you can even find a baseball. So we got contact lenses, and, and this was what happened after that. In the, the games that immediately followed, his batting average doubled. And friends, this is the point of that, that when we do these, these check-ins and when we allow them to influence how it is that we live our lives and, and we make adjustments that are required, it changes the way that we see others and it changes the way that we live. And I think all of us are invited to do this in all kinds of ways. Yes, you should see your optometrist, but Jesus is talking about what we see with our hearts and how it is that we live in the world and how it is that we're open to Jesus's presence among us. 
And so I think that's the invitation for us, is to, to, to engage in this well check that Jesus provides and to let, us, let ourselves recalibrate our lives according to what we find. I'll be honest with you, friends, this story is an unsettling one. And I'm not this morning going to try to settle it for you. Instead, I'm going to simply invite you to use it as a well check or as a, as a physical for your heart and your imagination, and perhaps most especially for your calendar and your vision. It is in the lack of seeing, after all, that the biggest question of the story, uh, which is where and in whom do we see Jesus, uh, that, that, that gets raised. And so we'll simply use this story as a mirror to reflect back on our own lives and see how it is that we might serve God and we might find God in the midst of it. And so, friends, that's my hope for us in the midst of this week, most especially this week as we do this work of serving together, that we would let it be a mirror, that we would let it be a reflection, that we would let it shape us, that we would be able to find ourselves in the story as individuals and as a congregation, and that we would then begin to make the changes that are necessary. And so, friends, that's my prayer and my hope this week, is that we will do that heart check that gut check, that we'll engage in it, and that we'll allow the experiences that we have one with another in the days to come, in the weeks to come, in all of the opportunities that we have to serve, that will allow them to recalibrate our lives so that we might begin to understand God better and we might begin to find Jesus everywhere in our midst. So may it always be. Amen. Um, I want to lift up um, one cool thing that we get this morning, a special treat, I would say. Uh, of the many changes that happened at General Conference, one of them was that deacons uh, are now uh, allowed to preside over communion. And so Pastor Jessica, as you know, is a deacon in the United Methodist Church. And it doesn't actually start till the end of the year, but we got special permission from the bishop to go ahead and live into it now. And so I'm excited about this as we prepare for communion. Uh, that Pastor Jessica gets to lead us. Friends, it is a joy to be able to invite you on behalf of Jesus to the table that Jesus sets before us. Um, all are invited and all are welcome. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets, who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. When nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. You healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. At his ascension, you exalted him to sit and reign with you at your right hand. On the night in which he gave himself for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving 
as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now with the confidence of children, let us pray the prayer that Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to invite our communion stewards forward. And I'd like to invite you all to join in together in our communion today. silence from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, let a rescue begin. Come find your mercy, oh sinner, come near. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't hear. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't hear. So lay down your There's hope for the hopeless and all those who have strayed. Come sit at the table, come taste the grace. There's rest for the weary, a rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't cure. So lay down.
Friends, what a joy. Will you pray with me? Holy God, we thank you for this grace that you have poured out upon us. God, may we remember the way that Jesus served and continues to serve us today. God, may we also be the hands and feet of Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.
Amen. Friends, uh, once again, I want to invite you to stay for lunch. We would uh, be thrilled to have you with us in just a couple of minutes. We'll begin that process as we get ready to serve. Um, but know this, as you go from this place, we began by singing today, You Are My Vision, and that is my hope and prayer that each one of us would develop the eyes and the vision to see God in our midst as we serve, uh, to be uh, surprised by grace and the places by which God comes to us. Go in grace and go in peace. Amen.